Well, welcome everyone. Um, of course, uh, I know every time Richard Dawkins is invited to speak, they always start with, he needs no introduction. Uh, and I guess I think that must be truer of him than most people in the world. Um, we all know he's uh, a scientist, an author, um, someone who has been so key in advancing public understanding, not only of science, but of reason, of atheism. I think if we did a poll amongst ex-Muslims and free thinkers across the world, I can kind of bet for sure that he would be the most inspirational figure for all of us. So it's such a pleasure and an honor to have you here with us. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, because it's Richard Dawkins, I'm extremely nervous. <laughs> I've written my questions here. And I was trying to be very clever, but I decided I'm not going to do that. And I'm just going to ask questions that I think maybe we would like to hear. I, I've listened to, I think, many of his interviews. Uh, so I'm going to try and ask questions that might not have been asked before. Uh, and hopefully, I'll do a little bit of justice to the person that sits here uh, before us. Before um, we go into the conversation, I want to show a very small clip of a debate that Richard Dawkins had with Mehdi Hassan. It's one of my favorites. Um, I mean, do you actually believe in your Muslim faith? Do you believe that Muhammad split the moon in two? Do you believe that Muhammad flew to heaven on a winged horse, for example? I, I pay you the compliment of assuming that you, that you don't. No, I do. I believe in miracles. You believe that? Yes. You believe that Muhammad went to heaven on a winged horse? Yes, I believe in God. I believe in miracles. I believe in revelation. I mean, the point here is that let's assume I'm wrong, Richard. I'm yeah, wrong. Yeah, let's. Um... Let, let's assume I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> If you, if, you, if you actually believe Mohammed flew to heaven on a winged horse, that's an anti-scientific belief. And that could be wrong. But, but that it well is wrong. But I mean, that, that doesn't change... Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't change... Uh, how do you know it's wrong? Oh, come on. You're a man of the 21st century. No, I'm you're... just asking. It comes back to my original question. The, the well, rational position is the agnostic... I mean, the rational position is the agnostic position. Why up there? What, the, uh, I mean, the know. rational position... I, I didn't say up there. I didn't pick a place. Okay, you well, what, a place. Why would a winged um, horse be the, be the way to get to heaven if uh, it's not up there? I, I, asked, I, asked, I asked a question about... You asked about proof. I'm all for saying I can't prove it. But can you prove he didn't do it? <laughs> I mean, this is, Can this is I the prove end old he debate. Didn't fly to heaven this is on the end. I'm just asking on your criteria. I'm just asking on no, your I criteria. No, I can't prove it, and I can't prove it wasn't a golden unicorn. But I'm or fascinated that you'd rather. I'm fascinated that you'd rather talk about uh, what animals the prophet may or may not have used 1,400 years ago, rather than talk about what Muslims or Islam is doing in the world today, good or bad. Well, uh, that uh, seems to be the distraction. Uh, if anyone's okay. distracted, it seems to be you. Well, that, that, that's your that's your view. I'm fascinated by how somebody, a, a, a respected, sophisticated journalist in the 21st century, could believe that a prophet flew to heaven on a winged horse. <laughs> if, you, if you all know the arrogant Mehdi Hassan, I mean, Richard Dawkins really got him, you know, in a tizzy, which is great. It was a wonderful thing to see. I mean, for me, when I look at uh, a lot of the interviews uh, that you do, um, what stands out for me is that you're always portrayed as someone who's very strident and someone who's very forceful, and yet you are really very calm, you're very witty, and you're quite... Um, you're very nice to your opponents in a way. Um, and so I, I, I find it must be difficult to be in that situation given that it's your job to be a lifelong educator. Religion has such a hold on us for centuries that when people hear somebody being reasonable and quiet and simply making arguments against it, it, so it genuinely sounds strident. It, if you compare it with theatre criticism or restaurant criticism, that can be far more strident, but people are used to that. But because it's religion, it just sounds different. It's, uh, it sounds shrill, it's, it sounds silent, uh, strident, it sounds aggressive, but all it is is just ordinary rational discourse. Uh, I mean, you do a lot of um, debates with 
uh, religious people. And um, I always wonder whether you do hear any arguments in favor of religion that, uh, well, I know you might not, you, you obviously don't think is true, but that you can see the point of. My position is a scientific one, and I am very anxious not to come across as arrogantly claiming that science knows everything. And therefore, um, it's absolutely right that there are plenty of things that science does not know. So, it's tempting for religious people to say, oh, well, science doesn't know the answer, therefore God must have done it. And that's a cowardly answer, that's not an answer at all. Um, the correct answer would be, science doesn't know yet, but we're working on it. So, I don't know of any, what I would call, really good arguments in favour of religion. However, there are points, there are gaps in science's understanding. In biology, only in, as a matter of detail, we've, as it were, we've got biology sewn up in, as far as evolution is concerned. In physics, I think there possibly are um, points of mystery which are so mysterious that um, one has to sort of lie back in admiration of, of how difficult it is and how difficult it is for physicists to do their, their job. Um, the origin of the universe, the Big Bang, the origin of the laws of physics, the origin of the... Um, physical constants, the physical constants are half a dozen or a dozen or so numbers that physicists can measure and they can't account for, they can't say where those measurements come from but what they can say is that if any of those measurements were ever so slightly different uh, the universe would not have the properties that it has and we could not be here. And so it's tempting to say that somebody fine-tuned it, it's tempting to say that um, if we have an, an array of ten knobs that people could, could, could twiddle to get the rheostats, adjust this physical constant here, this one, there, this one, this one. And because physicists can't explain why the knobs are exactly in the right position to give rise to a universe, galaxies, chemistry, uh, the sun, and, and eventually evolution and, and us, they, they like to postulate a sort of divine knob twiddler who gets these knobs in exactly the, the right position having premeditated it. That of course is not an explanation at all. We have to explain why the physical constants are the way they are and to say that some supernatural creator did it is absolutely evading the issue. You are simply pushing the question back as to how the, how the creator got, got into existence in the, in the first place. So. The, that, to me, has always been the only argument that, sounds, that even begins to sound persuasive. But even that is not persuasive at all. And I want to stress that because I've been caught out before when I've been pressed to say something, well, what's the nearest approach to a good argument you've ever, you've ever heard? Um, and I may have said something like, in fact, I did say something like, um, there could be, I could just, just about imagine a good argument for a deistic God. Comparing that to a theistic God who knows exactly who you sleep with and cares about it and knows what you wear and knows whether you cut your hair or don't cut your hair or wear a hat or don't wear a hat, whatever it is. Um, so I tried to show my contempt for that kind of theistic religion by contrasting it with a deistic religion which at least has some veneer of respectability. And I said this in a, in a debate with a dreadful man who I won't name. And I think two days later, he was up in Scotland giving a talk in Inverness, where I happened to have a friend who took notes of his speech. And he said, Dawkins has changed his mind. He's become a, a, a deist. <laughs> um, and I call this the, the Eddington Concession mining the Eddington concession. The great physicist Eddington once dramatized the importance of the second law of thermodynamics by saying something like this. If your theory is, is not supported by experiment, well, never mind, these experimentalists do get things wrong sometimes. Um, and he went on like that, and then, and then he said, but 
if your theory goes against the second law of thermodynamics, I can offer you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Now, what Eddington was doing in his initial concession was to say, by contrast with the, with the second law of thermodynamics, there may be other physical laws which are, yet, which are less certain. But, and I was doing the same thing with my de deism concession. That was analogous to the Eddington concession. And this man went up in Scotland and promoted this lie, really, um, that I had turned into a deist because of the, what I'd made the, that, that concession. I suppose on, on this, just keeping to this issue, um, you know, we all have family who are religious, who believe they're going to go to heaven. And I sometimes don't have the heart to tell my parents that that's not the case. So I, I, I guess I'm getting to that point where I know you insist on what's true. And, you, you know, that's very important. And of course it is. But is there something about religion that can give comfort uh, that might be seen to be positive? I mean, I don't think there's any positive in religion, and I've said it all the time, but that is an argument that might yes, make well, some sense. Yes, well, I'm never going to go to somebody's hospital bed, on their deathbed, and say, no, it's not, you're, you're just going to rot. Um, <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't... <coughs> I, excuse me. Excuse me. <coughs> I would be prepared to... Well, not exactly lie, but but keep keep quiet under the, under those sort of circumstances. If people want to read my books, they can they can read them. I'm I'm not a kind of doorstepping evangelist who goes and knocks on doors and and says, "Are you saved?" and and and, and you know, or, or rather, are you unsaved? Um, <laughs> so people are free to read what they, what I've written if if they want to. I I don't thrust it down their throats. And if it gets if it gives them comfort, if it gives them comfort, well. If you want to take comfort in a falsehood, that's your decision. <clears throat> uh, Salman Rushdie um, has, there's a quote of him which says, from the beginning men have used God to justify the unjustifiable. And I think it is important given the fact that he was attacked a week ago uh, to hear your comments on, on that whole attack. Well, I can't add to what everybody else thinks. I mean, it was a, a most appalling event. It was deeply disappointing because I had hoped, that, we'd all hoped that this threat to him had gone away. And uh, it, was, it was a terrible, terrible thing to happen. Um, the only thing I think I would add is um, when the fatwa was first uh, given out by the, that, that dreadful Ayatollah Khomeini who actually reminds me of God. He, he, he looks like God and behaves like God. Um, when, when that happened, the thing that really shocked me was the, with the cowardly response of, the, the, of other religious leaders like the then Archbishop of Canterbury, um, Carey, and various other intellectuals, especially the liberal left, who have shown despicable cowardice uh, in, the fa in the face of this kind of thing. <laughs> Of course, I think it's important to add, I think Pragna Patel is here from South All Black Sisters. Uh, there was a group of women uh, standing against uh, thousands of uh, Islamist men shouting for his death, and they were there saying, long live uh, Salman Rushdie. And I know many on the left in Iran uh, held pickets. I think Fari Bors was organized one of them at the time. So um, very, very important. But as you say, there well, were so many who didn't yeah. uh, support him. Um, I know you don't do movements, um, you know, uh, but but I, I think given the fact that this is an ex-Muslim uh, and free thought organized conference, I think, and I don't think anyone's ever asked you this, but we would love to know what you think about the ex-Muslim movement. I think it's wonderful. I'm, I'm in, entirely in favor of the ex-Muslim movement. I think it's courageous. I think it's very much needed. Uh, I hope it has some influence back in those countries which are, which are um, influenced by Islam. Um, I get encouraging reports uh, by private messages from various countries like Iran and Egypt uh, and uh, Pakistan and Iraq telling me that there is a groundswell of non-religious, uh, secular, atheistic opinion in these countries, but they have to stay under cover. And uh, my hope is that they'll become a kind of critical point 
where it, it, the dam will burst and suddenly will, people will, will, will realize that actually Islam does not have the same hold over, uh, or over so many minds as, as many people think. Uh, one of the things that really stands out for me about your work is you're always talking about the wonder and the poetry and the beauty of science. And it's such a contradiction with a religious view. You know, so if you can expand on that. Well, gosh, yes. Um, science is wonderful. Uh, it is also independent of where you happen to come from, which tribe you happen to belong to. Uh, the laws of physics are universal. The laws of physics are, are, insofar as we know they're true, they apply over the entire universe. There's not Japanese physics and American physics and Chinese physics and Indian physics and, and, uh, and Iraqi physics. And it's just physics. But if you look at people's attitude to almost everything else, it can, tends to be influenced by where they happen to be, their, their culture, their religion. One of the things that to me makes science beautiful <clears throat> is precisely that it is independent of where you happen to live. I'm sorry. I'm I know uh, people have asked you what you would like to be known most for and you've said your science um, um, and your books but other than that, what would you like to be most known for? Well, I can't really say other than that, because that, that is the main thing. I mean, I, I think um, I said science is beautiful. It is a truly wonderful thing that we in the 21st century are now in a position to pretty nearly understand why we're here. It's no longer wrapped in mystery. We understand the process that gave rise to us. We understand the process that gave rise to the galaxies and the stars the way they are. We are looking out at a universe which is pretty much understood. We are looking into ourselves, looking at the, the microscopic details of our own bodies and those of every other animal and plant and seeing the incredible complexity, the unbelievable complexity, which you would, it's easy to see why people thought it had to have a, have a creator. It seems to have creator written all over it. By the way, that's the kind of thing that gets picked up by, by people. Um, and what is truly wonderful is that actually we understand how that complexity has come about. We know that the laws of physics working through the amazing process of Darwinian natural selection can put together objects as incredibly complicated as ourselves, objects with brains which are now large enough to understand where, where they came from and why. I mean, to, to, it, to me, it is an amazing privilege to live in a time where we can say that. Uh, what would you consider your greatest accomplishment? Well, I'm really pleased to have written the books that I've written. I, I, um, I'm not looking forward to dying. Not, I'm not afraid, afraid of death itself, because you don't know anything about it. But I, 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 I love life. I like, I like to go on living. But the, it, it, when, I, when I die, I, I, I'm glad to be able to look back on having written, I forget how many books, but, but I'm pretty pleased with all of them, actually. Um, and um, I think that's mostly what, what I'm proud of or what I'd like to be re remembered for. I would not like to be remembered for f frivolous trivia like Twitter and, and things. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you have a favorite book that you've written? Oh, um, extended phenotype. yes, okay, extended phenotype. Um, but, uh, thank you, okay, I mean, Okay, I, I'll, I'll leave that to the audience. <laughs> um, what, what would you say are some of the most important key things that people need um, anywhere in the world to live a good life? I think a, a love of truth um, to, to recognize that the only reason for believing in anything is evidence. And do not 
believe something simply because somebody older than yourself tells you, unless that, that person, especially your parents or grandparents or teacher, unless you have some reason to suppose that they have evidence for what they, what they say. The fact that, some, that something is written down in a book th um, hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago is absolutely not a reason to believe it. Um, the fact that somebody with a clerical collar or whatever the Muslim equivalent is tells you something is true is not a reason to, to believe it. The fact that somebody says it has been privately revealed to me uh, <laughs> that something is true, that is absolutely not a reason to, to, to believe it. Um, always live, live your life as an evidence-based en enterprise, that's one thing. Morality. Well, we've just been listening to a fascinating discussion on morality, and we had a vote on whether morality was objective or subjective, and, and or, or don't know. And that's a genuinely difficult question. It's a it's a profound question. My personal view is that um, once you've got a premise as to what your morality is based on, then everything else can, can then follow objectively from from that. But you could different people could say, well, my my premise is the welfare of humanity. Somebody else might say, oh, that leaves out animals. What about sentient beings, the, the welfare of sentient beings? Um, other people might be racist and say, what matters is my race? Well, those all are premises that you could use for your, for your morality um, and then use um, objective reasoning to see what follows from, from that. Um, I, I think that the good life probably consists of something like Elaboration is the golden rule. Um, how would you like it if, if somebody did that to you? That, that, see, that is a principle which, on the face of it, is rather anti-Darwinian, actually. But never, nevertheless, I think it is a principle which humans have deeply embedded in their brains, and I'm delighted that, that it is. Um, so um, that rules out cruelty, that rules out, out can, um, making people, making anything that can suffer, suffer. Um, so, um, live your life so, so that you don't m make anything that's capable of suffering suffer. Um, and try to leave the world a better place than you found it. And as I say, returning and, and believe what's, tr what's true only on the basis of evidence. <laughs> Well, I, I think uh, Richard Dawkins is definitely one of those people that have left the world. You haven't left the world, but, you, you know, you've... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, you will leave the world a much better place than you found it. Um, he, he is someone who also... It's just... You, you're just such an interesting person in the sense that you're not this sort of... You're not just a scientist, you're a lover of poetry, you're a lover of novels, you're a lover of music, and that's quite evident in a lot of the, the, the debates you have the, the, uh, in your writings. I'd love to know who your favorite poet or writer is. Who? Um, <clears throat> or writers, well, poets. W.B. Yeats, oddly enough, because he's really mystical and had absurd beliefs. <clears throat> but I, I sort of love his, his, his lyrical poetry. Um, A. E. Hausman, Rupert Brooke, um, Shakespeare. Uh, well, that'll do for now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you um, also. We'd we'd love to hear maybe a poem that you love, if you'd like to recite one for us. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've got something written here. Um, my mother. <coughs> My mother died at the age of 109 um, a, c a couple of years ago, and um, I had, excuse me, <coughs> in my um, autobiography, I had published a short poem that she wrote, and A.C. Grayling, Anthony Grayling, who I think is a great a hero of the atheist movement, saw this poem and asked me whether there were any more and so my sister and I looked around to try to find in her p papers handwritten poems that she'd written. So might I read one of her, her poems? Um, and I also have one, Charles Darwin, if I could do it. Um, yeah. 
I can lean from my window and feel the wind about my face like water flowing dark and cold. The little lights of houses shine in level lines and mark where towns lie huddled close against the earth. And all about the wind blows by, cold song of winter on its breath. The great bear stands upon his head, his paws among the apple boughs that dark against a darker sky wave in the wind and tap their twigs with little sounds forlorn and sad within the night's dark emptiness. Charles Darwin is in danger of being cancelled in various places for um, his now outdated writings on race and things like that. So I just thought it'd be nice to um, read a poem uh, by his great-great-granddaughter, Ruth Padell, um, which is mostly just quotation from Darwin. She took Darwin's own words, um, I think mostly from the Voyage of the Beagle book, and um, arranged them into verse form. So this is kind of by Ruth Padell, but mostly by Charles Darwin. The thumb screws of Rio. Mr. Earle has seen a stump of the joint wrenched off by the thumb screw so often kept in a family house. A simple vice with studs on interior surfaces, the thumb placed in and slowly crushed. Faces so close they smell each other's breath. If I hear a distant scream, I remember a house where I heard most pitiable moans, and I suspected some poor slave was being tortured, but was powerless to remonstrate. I lived opposite an old lady who crushed the fingers of her female slaves. I stayed in a home where a young mulatto was reviled, beaten, and persecuted every hour, enough to break the spirit of the lowest animal. I've seen a boy, six or seven, struck thrice with a whip on his naked head before I could interfere. For having handed me a glass of water not quite clean, I saw his father tremble at a single glance from his master's eye. This day we have finally left the shores of Brazil. I thank God I shall never see a slave country again. Dear friends, the wonderful Richard Dawkins. Thank you.